book of the Nazarim and the book of John the Enlightened of Elohim were included together in a text known as the Gospel of the Kaleidi, meaning wise strangers. The origins of this work are debated, as no original manuscripts have ever been found. However, it is commonly believed that the books were preserved and passed down by Celtic believers in the 1500s after previously being saved from arson, possibly either the burning of the Library of Alexandra or the Glastonbury Abbey fire in 1184. It has been tucked away alongside a secular work known as the Colburn. However, they don't remotely share any similarities. Whether this is a complete and divinely inspired text can certainly be debated. Nevertheless, we do believe that it contains the words from our Messiah that were not captured in the canonical gospel accounts. As stated by the Apostle John, if everything the Messiah did were recorded, all of the books in the world could not contain them. In this volume, you will find astonishing parables, new and old, that will challenge your walk. Join us as we test this book, allowing the Spirit of the Most High to guide us unto what is true. Shabbat Shalom and welcome brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube live stream of our Book of Nazarene reading and study. My name is Adam, your host, and I welcome you. Uh, this week, we're going to be getting into chapter six. And well, like always, there's so much to go over, so I don't want to delay anything. Let's start with prayer and we'll get right into it. Father Yahweh Most High, we just come before you and bless you, praise you, and thank you for sending your Son that we may have forgiveness and eternal life, that his blood has reconciled us, Father, that has cleansed us. And we just thank you for also showing us the goodness of your whole word and how it's applicable to our lives today. Thank you for giving us books like these in the last days to continue to grow in wisdom, Father. And we just thank you so much. None of this is possible, of course, without you, our Heavenly Father. And, um, we just ask that you'd bless this study by your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, uh, that we may be faithful hearers and doers of your word. In Messiah Yahushua's name, we honor you and bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's uh, let's get right into it. Uh, actually, uh, Shofar. Let's do Shofar, and then we'll get your Shofars ready. You ready? Okay, so here we are, Book of Nazarene, Chapter 6. Uh, just in case you're just stumbling across this, this book is available for free. You'll find it in the P uh, in the See More section of the, under the video, also the pinned comment. Uh, it'll be a free PDF download for you. Also, for those of you that like to have it in your hands, uh, that is available as well. But the book is for free. Take advantage of that. All right, Chapter 6, let's get into it. Lots to cover. As I've said before, this book kind of just gets better as you get into it. So here we go. Before going out among the people to declare himself, Yahusha returned to Gennesareth, the town of his upbringing, accompanied by his disciples. He went first to the place where his mother was staying, and though she greeted him warmly because she loved her eldest son, Miriam did not fully understand Yahusha. She always knew he would grow up to be different and would become a man of Elohim because, when carrying him, she dreamed that a bright flaming star had come down from heaven and entered her womb. This is, you know, just kind of showing his, uh, his divinity that he's not just man. He is Elohim, the son that came down and, of course, became a man. Um, but this, this just, you know, shows more proof of his divinity. We, we really got into this, into the book of Enoch that showed his preexistence, which I mean, all you have to, also you all have to do is read the book of John and see that, uh, he was in the beginning with the father. And of course, nothing that was made was made without him. But, uh, I'd like to quickly on this, about this part right here. She dreamed that a, bl uh, a bright flaming star had come down from heaven and entered her womb. I'll show you two witnesses, uh, uh through this, of uh, this being true. This is uh, the Testament of Levi, chapter 5, at least in this R.H. Charles version. Um, we're going to read verse, uh, chapter 5, verses 9 through 30. If you're not 
sure how to read this book either. You know, also in the, the see more section under the video in the description box, uh, there'll be a link for the study notes. And I, on the study notes, I have a link for everything we go over. So if you're like, ah, I forgot to write, write down that, uh, that verse, that reference that Adam was talking about, you'll have all of my notes right there, um, at your disposal. So, uh, Testament of Levi, if you're not familiar, was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls um, and pre-exists Messiah's coming. So, I believe this is a legitimate book. Therefore, shall they be taken captive and become prey. This is talking about the people of Israel. And their land and their substance shall be destroyed. And in the fifth week, they shall return to their desolate country and shall renew the house of Yahuwah. Obviously, this is talking about when they came back from Babylon. And in the seventh week shall become priests who are idolaters, adulterers, lovers of money, proud, lawless, lascivious, abusers of children and beasts. This is, this is the, the false shepherds that Messiah came and rebuked. You know? And after their punishment shall have come from Yahuwah, the priesthood shall fail. Then shall Yahuwah raise up a new priest, and to him all the words of Yahuwah shall be revealed. Of course, this is Messiah. And he shall execute a righteous judgment upon the earth for a multitude of days. And listen, and his stars shall arise in heaven as of a king. So this is kind of going back to, um, oh, going back to right here. She dreamed that a brain up. Uh, so the same thing. A bright flaming star had come down from heaven and entered her womb. Lighting up the, the light of knowledge as the sun, in, I'm sorry, so the sun, the day, and he shall be magnified in the world. He shall shine forth as the sun on the earth and shall remove all darkness from under heaven. There shall be peace in all the earth. The heavens shall exult in his days and the earth shall be glad and the clouds shall rejoice. And the knowledge of Yahuwah shall be poured forth upon the earth as the water of the seas. And the angels of the glory in the presence of Yahuwah shall be glad in him. The heaven shall be opened, and from the temple of glory shall come upon him sanctification with the Father's voice as from Abraham to Isaac. And the glory of the Most High shall be uttered over him, and the spirit of understanding and sanctification shall rest upon him in the water. I believe this is talking about the moment he's baptized and the spirit rests upon him, and the Father is like, this is my beloved son, you know. For he shall give the majesty of Yahweh to his sons in truth forevermore, and there shall none succeed him for all generations forever. And in his priesthood, the Gentiles or the nations shall be multiplied in knowledge upon the earth and enlightened through the grace of Yahuwah. In his priesthood shall sin come to an end and the lawless shall cease to do evil. And he shall open the gates of paradise and shall remove the threatening sword against Adam. And he shall give to the saints to eat from the tree of life and the spirit of holiness shall be on them. And Belial, Satan, shall be bound by him and shall he shall give power to his children to tread upon the evil spirits. And Yahuwah shall rejoice in his children and be well pleased in his beloved ones forever. Then shall Abraham and Isaac and Jacob exult, and I will be glad, and all the saints shall clothe themselves with joy. And now, my children, you have heard all. Choose therefore for yourselves either the light or the darkness, either the law of Yahuwah or the works of Belial. No, there's no middle ground with Yahuwah. It's either hot or cold. There is no lukewarm. You're not on, you're not, you can't be a fence rider. And of course, we see this also in the book of Numbers in the Torah, 24, 17 through 19. This is uttered by Balaam of all people, but he did prophesy. This is Numbers 24, 17 through 19. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. So this is what it's talking about right here. She dreamed that a, a bright flaming star had come down from heaven and entered her womb. Messiah is the fulfillment uh, of, of course, this right here, this prophecy about this star coming out of Jacob. So uh, let's get back to chapter 6. We're going to be at verse 2 of the book of Nazarim. His own kinsmen had once thought him mad and sought to take control of him, which makes sense. We don't get a whole lot from his childhood, but if we're getting some extra details here that we haven't gotten before, I mean, if he was treated wrongfully in his adulthood, you might wonder if he was maybe not treated fairly in his childhood. But now his brothers and sisters having grown up, they no longer troubled him. They had said, he has lost his father and seeks another. For is it not written, I will be his father and he will be my son. When younger, Yahusha had been overawed by the prospects of the future. 
So this is like just like thinking of the magnitude of, of what's ahead of him because he knew and often fearful that he might not fulfill the promise. Some people might take offense to that, but hang on. But he overcame this and any fears of his inability, it is in this and his dedication that his greatness was revealed. So Messiah had to overcome things just like we do. We'll read this in the next passage and I'll show you lots of um, uh, scriptural references from the canon that confirms this. Though Yahusha wielded the Ruach HaKodesh of Yahuwah, and in him it was stored up as in a water tank, he still had to overcome the weaknesses of men. For without doing so, his greatness could not be made manifest. Those who say he was something other than man detract from his greatness. For then the things he had to do would have been easier to accomplish. Perhaps they cannot comprehend the heights to which men can rise when inspired by Yahuwah, the father of all men. So let's break this down. So some people may take offense to this because it says uh, those who say he was something other than man detract from his greatness. But I got to ask you, if Messiah Yahusha did not come down fully as man, of course, he had the wisdom from Yahuwah. He was a prophet. He foresaw things. Uh, he, he saw things in the spiritual realm. He saw demons. Well, he, he obviously had all these powers, but at the core of him, he did become a man and had the weaknesses of men. We'll see, um, we'll see this in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4. It says, For the word of Elohim is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Pause there real quick. Um, you know, people will, will just kind of turn and be like, Oh, that's talking about our Bible, which... The scriptures do contain the word of Yahuwah. It is the word of Yahuwah. But this, as you'll see, the word of Yahuwah is talking about a living being, which we know in the book of Revelation, it says, and his name is the word of Elohim. That is one of his names or titles of Messiah. So it says the word of Elohim is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So now we're talking about, definitely talking about something that's not just pages in a, in a, in, in a Bible. We're talking about a living being. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, we just read about in the book in the book of uh, or the Testament of Levi, that is passed into the heavens, Yahusha, the son of Elohim, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So he was tempted with the thing, same things we get tempted with, you know, with un, with, with anger, with jealousy, with um, with um, uh, fearfulness, which is what we read in the book of Nazarim, that um, he was often fearful that he might not fulfill the promise, but he overcame this and any fears of his inability, right? And so was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So it was very fitting and proper that our leader, our great king, our great high priest had to overcome the same things that we do so that, you know, I mean, that's just a good leader. I, I've mentioned this, I think, in previous um, um readings of this, if not than other studies, um, that a good leader leads by example. And a good leader has gone through these same struggles that we go, we, that we've gone through so that he's like, hey, I know, I know what you're going through. And I know that you can overcome this. I overcame it. Follow my footsteps. And, you know, this is, I mean, obviously the talking from the perspective of Messiah. Uh, but any good leader leads from the front and any good leader has gone through the same things that his people has gone through. But we have to admit that Messiah came as a man, right? So it says here, for without doing so, his greatness could not be made manifest. Those who say, this is back at Nazarene 6.4, those who say he is something other than man detract from his greatness. And this is what the word says. John 1.14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of great grace and truth. So if we look at the Greek word for flesh or made flesh, the uh, Greek word is sarx. And um, flesh, carnal, um, 
flesh, the substance of the living body, which covers the bones, um, the body of a man, uh, the sensuous nature of man, the animal nature, um, a living creature possessed by a body of flesh, whether man or beast. Uh, let's see. So this is talking about he came right, human nature. He came in human nature with its frailties, physically or morally, and passions. So this is what the Greek word is talking about, that he was made flesh. He became a human being. He became a man. 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Elohim was made manifest in the flesh. He became a human, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the nations, believed on in the world, received up unto glory. First John 4, 2 through 3, Hereby know you the spirit of Elohim. Every spirit that confesses that Yahushua HaMashiach is come in the flesh is of Elohim. It has come in the body of a man, again, as we saw, with, with flesh, with the frailties, uh, with the, the natures, the senses of man. And every spirit that confesses not that Yahushua HaMashiach is come in the flesh is not of Elohim. So everyone that says that he did not come as a man is not of Elohim. And that this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Second John 7, 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Yahushua HaMashiach is come in the flesh, is come as a human being, is come as a man. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist. And we'll stop there. So my question to you is, I mean, this is why it's important. It says that for those who say he was something other than man detract from his greatness. For then the things he had to do would have been easier to accomplish. I mean, think about it. If he came down in just the form of Elohim or the form of like an angel, then would, it, would he really have had the same temptations? Would he really have had the same troubles? Would he have hungered? Would he have thirsted? Because we know that eternal beings don't. And again, we're not detracting from that he is an eternal being. He was with the Father before the creation of heaven and earth. But when he came down, we have to acknowledge that he was man. Because again, if he came down as an angel, he wouldn't have these frailties. He wouldn't have these uh, things to overcome. And so as a good leader, he's showing us that, hey, I, he's, like, he's like, I overcame these things and so can you. What can, and this is what it says here, perhaps they cannot comprehend the heights to which men can rise when inspired by Yahuwah, the father of all men. I mean, think about it. This is what, this is what uh, Paul says here, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. All things. And that includes keeping the commandments. But Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 30, 10 through 16, if you obey the voice of Yahweh Elohim to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the Torah, if you turn to Yahweh Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul, for this commandment which I command you this day is not too hard for you. So anyone that says the law was too hard, nobody can do it, is, this is against what the Torah even says. Neither is it far off. It's not some, in some distant place. It's not in heaven that you should say, who will go up for us to heaven and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. See, I have set before you this day life and good, death and evil, if you obey the commandments of Yahweh Elohim, which I command you this day by loving Yahweh Elohim, by walking in his ways, and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his ordinances, then shall you live and multiply, and Yahweh Elohim will bless you in the land which you're entering to take possession of it. But think about this. It says here, back in the book of Nazarene, it says, Perhaps they cannot comprehend the heights to which men can rise when inspired by Yahweh, the father of all men. Sirach 2 Verse 10, consider the ancient generations and see whoever trusted in Yahuwah was put to shame or whoever persevered in the fear of Yahuwah was forsaken or whoever called upon him was overlooked. I mean, think about the greats, the greats before us. Look at what Abraham was able to accomplish, Noah, Enoch. Think about, you know, Abraham, Isaac. Think about Jacob. The, oh, the, the Jacob had a rough time, didn't he? He had a rough go at it. Think about Moshe and all the things he went through. David, and the list goes on. Gideon, think about what, what they are able to do, right? When inspired by Yahuwah, and what could we do today if we truly took hold of this and follow the example of Messiah? Back to Nazarim, chapter 6, verse 5. 
Going into the temple, Yahusha stood up to read as he had often done in the holy days. He read out a passage from the scroll of a prophet to the Yahudim called Yeshayahu. So he read this to the Jews called Isaiah in the tongue of his father and having done so, returned it to the scroll keeper and sat down. After others had performed their duties, Yahusha had a chance to speak. And with all eyes upon him, he did so. And the people were astonished. For he said, Behold, you are witnessing the fulfillment of the Holy Writ and the accomplishment of Yahuwah's design. I am chosen to be the tongue of the Father, speaking his words to you and his people. I am the light shining in the midst of the darkness. And even as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, so do I come to show how the good are to be separated from the wicked. He comes not only to bring peace and shalom, he comes to separate because the truth itself, the light separates. You go in a dark room and you flick on a, well, maybe you light a torch or a match or whatever, a lighter. The light separates from the darkness. The darkness can't overcome it, but it separates. He is a separator. In the scriptures, uh, the canon tells us the same thing. Matthew 3, 11 through 12. This is John the Baptist. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Ruach HaKodesh and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. He comes to separate. And if you think about it, you know, this is talking about also in reference to the wheat and the tares. Well, all these people were in his field. So he comes to separate even his own people, not just believers from unbelievers. That's, that's a given. He's talking about separating who, all the people that claim to be his. Matthew 10, 34 through 37. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father. And the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He comes to be a separator. Does, does he does he come to, to like purposefully put discord in your house? And be like, pff, pff, pff. No, but he came to give truth, and some people are going to accept it, and some aren't. And by that, it divides. That's what happens. Let's go to, um, uh, there's quite a few Nazarim references I want to go over. So just put a uh, put a little bookmark here in chapter 6, if those of you that are reading um, along uh, in the physical books. We're going to go through a tour, tour to book of Nazarim about Messiah being the separator. First, we're going to go to chapter 1, verse 20. Chapter 1, verse 20. It says this, Yosef and Miriam could not understand the meaning of this and asked what was meant. Whereupon the man replied, I hold a sapling. This is when he was a baby. Uh, Messiah was a baby, which will grow into a sturdy tree under the shade of which many nations will find peace. Peace. Yet he will also test the strength of our people, tearing them apart in dispute. He comes as a separator, dividing the sheep from the goat, showing each his rightful place. He will place a sword in the hands of the weak and strengthen them, and the ungodly will be smitten. Let's go to chapter 2, verse 12. Chapter 2, verse 12. This is John the Baptist speaking or prophesying over Messiah Yahushua. I prophesy great things for you. You are the true son of Elohim. Soon you will see the glory of heaven revealed and the power of the Ruach HaKodesh will be poured out upon you as a stream of pure water. The time has come to proclaim yourself. Peace, peace on you whom our Elohim has chosen as his messenger. For you will proclaim the true gospel. Strengthen your heart, for the road ahead is steep and stony. No man is hated so much as one who tries to point out defects in character and attitudes and seeks to guide men along the path of right and beneficial living. And when you do things like that, you become a separator. Let's go to Nazarene chapter 9, verse 31. Chapter 9, verse 31.
Now this is a very interesting one. Remember, the the field, the field is 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 his plantings. We look at all the the parables, the the parable of the sower. These plants are those that have heard the word, and of course, some bring much fruit. Some get choked out by the by the cares of the world, tribulation. Listen to this. Think about this. This is a this is another. Uh, expansion on the or, or, or expanding on the parable of the sower. Listen to this. I had to read this like a couple times uh, the other day. Nazarene 931. I bring light to the threshing floor of life where suffering and misfortune are the flails. I'll explain all this in a second. Tribulation and distress the winnowing fan and the wisdom of Yahuwah the winnowing shovel. Here the wheat is separated from the husks, the chaff is thrown out, and the good grains are gathered up. Now listen, this is this is how um, we're, we're super removed from how the grains processed. But uh, long story short, especially with wheat, um, the wheat first has to be beaten, and this is the flails. Then, then the um, what they would do is they would have a winnowing fan. So basically, they would create wind, and they would pour the grains, and the wind would just fling away the chaff and the grains would fall down. And then, of course, after the grains are down on the floor, the shovel, of course, they'd shovel it into a barrel or whatever kind of... Uh, so with that in mind, let's let's reread this. I bring the light to the, th the threshing floor of life where suffering and misfortune are the flails. So literally the world beats us. That separates. The tribulation and distress... The winnowing fan. We talked a lot about this, not last, uh, I think this was part three. We talked a lot about life is hard and it's supposed to be. This is how he separates. This is how he finds out who are the hypocrites. This is how he finds out really who, who are his. And this is a, and a good a good farmer that's diligent about his crop, that wants to get gather every grain, separates, separates the useless things from the useful things. The chaff separates from the grains. Here wheat is separated from the husks, the chaff is thrown out, and the good grains are gathered up. So again, he is the separator. Let's go to Natsurim 13, 18. Book of Natsurim chapter 13, verse 18. It says this, You may think in your hearts that I come to bring peace to the earth and concord among men. And this is true. For such will be under the rule of Elohim. Under the rule of Elohim, it'll be shalom in his kingdom. However, before this comes about, those who oppose it must be defeated. Those who, people who don't want to walk in shalom. Those people who don't, who don't search for shalom. Remember, we, we uh, I've uh, Hebrews twelve fourteen, follow or pursue shalom, peace with all men and holiness, without which no one will see Yahweh. So, if you are currently not seeking peace with your neighbors or even all people, it says you won't see Yah. That should cut to the heart. So again, those who oppose Shalom must be defeated. Therefore, I come to arm those who are loyal to the cause, to put a sword into the hands of men and stinging words on the tongues of women. Henceforth, families will be divided against themselves and brother will be separated from brother and father set against son. Separator. Does he want discord in a family? No, but he wants to separate who are who's really his and who isn't. And he's showing you the most extreme because the family unit is important to Yahweh. He created it. And the devil's whole purpose, one of his main things he's been doing is to divide the family or, or you know, is, is to get family separated and those kind of things. So is that what Yah really wants? No, but he's showing one of the most extreme situations where the truth will even divide up families. And those of you alive today, Obviously, you're listening, so you're alive. Um, you know that. You've seen it. You may have been one of the fortunate ones that um, your whole family stayed together. The, you know, both spouses came into the truth together. All the children embraced it. Hallelujah. It doesn't happen all the time. And it's rough. Let's go one more. Uh, thir chapter 13, verse 62. So a little bit further in this chapter. Thirteen sixty-two of not stream. Yahusha answered, "Vultures gather where carcasses lies, and bees where the flowers grow. Flies are drawn to stinking meat. Brave men converge on the battlefield, while cowards seek their hideouts. The day of decision, 
I think this is the day of Yahuwah, will come like a roll of thunder. And on that day, those serving the cause of Yahuwah will be separated from those who serve the power of darkness. This is one of the reasons why I believe when it says that, you know, one will be taken and the other left. I think this is like he's taking them, I don't know, taking the good away, you know, into safety when the others will be there in tribulation. But anyways, um, back to back to chapter six. Just wanted to drive home the point that separation happens. Truth. Truth divides, especially Yahuwah's truth. I mean, even exposing the lies of this world and talking about just, you know, truth or topics that divides. You know, with that whole thing with the, the the thing that they were trying to stick in everyone's arm and that divided families. How much more the truth, truth. This is like the truth, truth, or truth, truth, truth. That was totally unnecessary. Sorry. All right. Uh, it didn't even make any sense. Um, let's go to Nazarene chapter 6, verse 8. Yahushua spoke with knowledgeable authority, bringing a new message which gladdened the hearts of those who heard him. The people marveled and whispered among themselves, Where has he gained all this knowledge? How has he become so learned? Because it was, pause there, it was standard, of course, that, you know, teachers of the law went through the schools and went through the, all these different things, just, just like today. You know, if someone's not an ordained uh, or didn't go to seminary, they're like, you know, what do you know? You haven't been properly trained but we know that true wisdom comes from the word and from Yahweh giving the wisdom. It's not through the training and the institutions of men. But that's why they were asking this question. Is this not the son of Yosef, the carpenter, who is now dead and of Miriam? And do not his sisters still live here? Yet they say he has healed the incurable, but not all received his words in this many, manner, and many were offended. Verse 9. Noticing the murmuring among these, Yahushua addressed them, saying, Do you hold it against me that I left? Because he's talking to people in his hometown. If a man has two duties, he must make a choice. Listen to this. Not following the inclinations of the heart. This is what the world preaches. You know, follow your heart. Follow your, you know, what, you know, what your heart thinks. That's all. That's Disney and all they say. And we know Jeremiah 17, 19, 7, something. Says that, um, uh, it says the, the thoughts of the heart uh, are... Uh, wicked continually who can you know who can know it but anyways so not following the inclinations of the heart but the course indicated by a higher decree so this is this is following um you know the the call the duty that that we have all been called to no doubt you have heard about the things that i've done elsewhere and will say let us see you do the same here to this I can answer with sincerity, a prophet is unacceptable in his own neighborhood, and a physician is not called to cure those who know him. When I come in friendship and compassion to those who need my help, they say, Physician, heal yourself first, thinking me mad. Why now should I be called upon to do things Eliyahu and Elisha could not do? The only ones they cured were Syrians. And and, and um, I'm not a prophet at all, um, but... What I what I do know is that Yahweh has transformed my life, and I've been called to share this, whatever that looks like. And my family, my close family that know that knew for you know from that knew the things that I went through and all the um, I, I went through really rough phases in my life, and I was a transgressor, and a lot of my family saw these things. So now you know that I've changed. You know, even though like they're like, oh, Adam's, you know, he's he's. You know, he's better, he's, he's different, he's, he's great, but they're not quite still listening to, um, I, I've tried to share the ministry with them and the videos, but no one's really interested. I think because deep down they're like, I mean, why should I listen to you? Like, I know you, I know what kind of person you used to be, uh, and yeah, you may have changed, but like, why should, like, who are you? You know what I mean? So um, I, I can completely understand this, and I think a lot of you know that. Uh, trying to share, of course, with your family and friends that maybe knew you in your past or like, why would I listen to you, you know? Anyways, <clears throat> verse 10, Yahushua did not heal many here. And he said, I heal in accord with the Torah, not against it. And one of the things that we, we saw all throughout the gospel, the canonical gospel accounts is Messiah purposefully healed on the Sabbath day. I really think he was trying to drive home a point that, listen, there is no Torah law that says, there's no law from the Father that says you can't heal on the Sabbath day. It was only man-made traditions that said that. Uh, so he was openly showing them that these man-made traditions um, have, have no place in the kingdom. And of course, that rubbed them the wrong way because like we see today, 
people are so saturated with the traditions that they've inherited that they refuse to let them go. And that's what we saw 2000 years ago. And, you know, that problem has only gotten worse, uh, of course, through uh, the other side, Christianity, which has their man-made traditions that people don't want to let go of. Any case, with the with that being said, let's go keep going. Nazarene six eleven. After hearing what he said in the temple, many people were vexed with him and sought to hustle him out of the town. But others said, "Let him be, for he grew up here and is only the son of a carpenter." So they're like, "He's just a nobody." Therefore, he tries to make himself important. He has been away and seeks to impress us. This sounds like the idle and catty talk of people today. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't stop. Keep going. Verse 12. Being so poorly received in the town where he had been brought up, Yahushua went out around the villages, choosing 12 apostles from his, among his disciples. He sent them away in pairs to deal with many things caused by the intrusion of evil. He said to them, Carry a staff, but take no food, no money, and no change of clothing. When you are invited to a house, stay there until you leave the village, but never tarry where you are not welcome. Yahushua said, many will fail to grasp your meanings or will interpret your words wrongly. Do not dispute with them, but put things right with patience. Never disregard a questioner or abuse him, lest others think you have no answer. All can only grasp what you say according to their understanding. Therefore, speak plainly into their hearts. So this is really important. Um, this is really, I think, really can ring true for our lives today where he says many will fail to grasp your meanings or will interpret your words wrongly so when sharing the truth of a uh, a walk of faith and obedience of course a lot of people are just like you know they go right to what they've been taught all their lives that the law is done away with it's too hard it's for jews only we're not jews we're gentiles and a lot of people will try to you know twist up your words um and, and, and those kind of things. And, and this is really wise words. Don't dispute. We're not supposed to get into like a back and forth argument with people. We can just share a few things. And if people don't accept it, they don't accept it. But the, the key here is uh, put things right with patience and don't disregard a questioner or abuse him. So we're not to get into like a, a passionate back and forth. Well, no, 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 no. That's, that's not what, that's not Messiah's style. Um, and I quote this a lot too because it's so important, I think. Second Timothy 2, 24 through 26. It says this, And the servant of Yahweh, this is not talking just about teachers, evangelists, leaders. This is talking about anyone who's his servant. Are you a servant of Yahweh? I ask you. So, and the servant of Yahweh must not strive. That's like being frictionate, you know, being uh, hard or abusive. So, must not strive, but be gentle unto all, all men, apt to teach and patient in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If Elohim peradventure or perchance or he might give them the repentance to acknowledging of the truth. So if you know someone is just dead wrong, let's not use that word. If you know someone is just wrong, excuse me, when you choose your words rightly, correctly. Uh, if you know someone is wrong and you're trying to share this and they're just bucking and whatever, listen, it says be meek with them, be patient, gentle. I know some people think I'm just too soft, but really this is like what the scriptures teach us how to be. Everybody, not everybody, a lot of people think that we're all like Elijah talking to Ahab, you know, in their face yelling. Um, and that's just, that's just not kind of where we are. Just like Elijah called down fire and that was appropriate for that time. But then, you know, thousands of years later, um, you know, they're like, Messiah, are, are we going to bring down fire upon these people like Elijah? He's like, no, no, no. Don't you understand? I've come, I'm not come here to, 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 to kill, but to heal. Um, but anyways, the, the point is, is this is how we need to carry ourselves when sharing the, the good news. Also, First Peter 3, 13 through 16. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify Yahweh Elohim in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks of you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Gentle, patient, this is how we're supposed to be. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you of your good conversation in Messiah. And this word conversation actually means more than just talking. It's talking about your your behavior, your, your uh, yeah, well, really your behavior. 
And so it says here, uh, again, don't dispute with him, but put all things with patience. This is back at Natsurim 614. Uh, never disregard a questioner or abuse him. So we're supposed to sow the truth in meekness and humility and patience. And just remember, you know, um, recognizing that sometimes there's a, there's a brick wall and saying here, all can only grasp what you say according to their understanding. Therefore, speak plainly into their hearts. A lot of, there are some people that, you know, sometimes have a very, very vast and wide vocabulary. And just keep in mind, if you're one of those people who's highly intelligent, very well spoken, uh, remember sometimes you may need to like bring your vocabulary down a little bit because not all of us speak that way. You can speak way over someone's head. And though you're like meaning well, um, and this is also not to like degrade somebody and speak to them like they're a child, like, so what you need to do, that's not what I'm saying. But, you know, some people can just be so eloquent with words that it can sometimes just go way over people's head and they just, they won't catch it. And so the the seed won't be properly planted. So just remember, we're called to, to sow and to reap. In a lot of cases, when you're having these, these discussions, you're sowing. You're, 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 you're there to sow a seed, not to change someone's mind. That is up to Yahweh. That's what it says here in Second um, <clears throat> Timothy 2. Uh, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if Elohim peradventure or perhaps will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So it, Yah will give them that. It's up to him, not up to us. So, all right. Book of Nazarene, chapter 6, verse 5. 15. Yahusha himself went about proclaiming the advent of the rule of Elohim, talking about the kingdom. And he also cured many kinds of sickness. Then people began to say, this man is great and good even among those dedicated to the service of Elohim. And many heeded his teaching and led a new life. This this was actually kind of where we began last week, where he came to like bring a, a real change with people. A lot of the people were rude and extortioners and liars and thieves and and um, um, were just nasty to each other. Excuse me, nasty to each other. And so, but anyways, it says that many heeded his teachings and led a new life. Um, this is what he came to do. This is again what we spoke about last week, Second Peter three eleven through fourteen. So this is Peter. Just to t- kind of preface before this, Peter's talking about the burning up of heaven and and the end coming and all these kind of things. And he says so. He summarizes it with this: seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, the, the heavens, right? What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? And again, this cover word conversation used in the KJV is more so uh, like your behavior. So what kind of behavior? Seeing that all these things are coming to pass, are going to happen, what kind of behavior are you are you going to have? Are you are you going to be acting? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of Elohim, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth. That's New Jerusalem, how I understand it. Wherein dwells righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And so I believe this is talking about and many heeded his teaching and led a new life, a, a renewed life, a new understanding of how they're to, to walk. And this, of course, famous words, Romans 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because we know that we're saved by the grace, by the favor of Yahuwah. Elohim forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? Know you not that as many of us as were baptized into Yahushua HaMashiach were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Messiah was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in a newness of life. Since this is what it's talking about. Many heeded his teachings and led a new life. And that's the goal and purpose here. This isn't about being a broken uh, and sinful individual, him healing you, and then you just stay as a broken and and uh, sinful individual. We're, we're to lead a new life. We're to uh, get up off of the floor, off of the, the filth that we are in, and walk in a new way. Uh, I want to read one more passage here. It says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey the lust thereof. So Paul wasn't ta- talking some lawless thing here. He was just trying to show some of the hard passages like right here. Uh, for sin shall not have dominion over you for you're not under the law, but under the grace. This is not saying that, you know, the law is done away with. But I believe he was trying to share the, the hard message uh, that, you know, we're no longer 
um, forgiven by these animal sacrifices and the blood of these animals, much like Hebrew, the book of Hebrews is talking about and the change of the priesthood, that now we've been reconciled by the blood of Messiah. And that doesn't mean to walk in a, in a lawless way. Anyways, most of you listening uh, are, get this point uh, pretty well, so we won't uh, continue to to, um, to go to, to talk about that. But it, it talks about, I just want to mention this, that many heeded his teachings and led a new life. I, I want to talk about his teachings from a, a bird's eye view. Uh, most of you hopefully have read, the, if you're if you're searching this book out, I'm hoping that you've uh, read the four canonical gospels first. That's that should be first and foremost. Uh, but also, you re- so you read through all those, and you read through this, and you really zone in on the teachings of Messiah. You look at all the things he focused on, and how much time he spent focusing on certain things. So, and I and I look at. Uh, I'm not here to judge anyone's life or how they spend their time or their research or anything. But I just want to simply ask a question: How much time did Messiah spend? teaching the calendar ask yourself that versus how much time did he spend teaching us how to cherish each other to build up each other not to 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 point fingers at at each other of course there is rebuke and there's rebuke and love but done in the right way and meekness and patience so how much time did he spend teaching us the calendar how much time did he spend teaching us the pronunciation the correct pronunciation and all these other topics that seem to be the focus of some people. And so, again, I'm not judging you. I'm just, as your brother, simply asking you, how much time are you really following the teachings of Messiah? And I'm not saying that the calendar is not important. We've talked about the calendar. But I see there's so much contention and arguing and striving and division over it that it's like, man, are, are, we, are we also straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel? Are we missing the big picture? Matthew 24, 44 through 51, also considering about the things that we uh, disagree on and, and, and strive about. And so um, disagreement, there's nothing wrong with disagreements. We're going to have disagreements. When it's, it's, it's very interesting to me when, uh, let's just take the calendar, for example. I've known many friends, close brothers and sisters that have also prayed and fasted uh, like myself and many others have to, for Abba to teach us his calendar. And we do this, and then we arrive at different conclusions, and like five or six different conclusions, or maybe even many more. And you ask yourself, does you know do, do any, you know wh- why can this happen? Maybe Yahweh is allowing that on purpose, knowing that we're really trying to seek out these matters. We we really want to call upon His true name. We really want to make sure we're reading the the right books, uh, not not incorrect ones. We really want to make sure that we've got the right calendar because. We want to celebrate his stuff on the right day. So these are honest, these are good core thoughts, right? But I think it's a major test that he allows these things to happen. I think he allows different interpretations to happen just as a testing ground to see how we treat each other. And you think about, again, how much time Messiah spent on how we treat each other, because I think that was a major issue thousands of years ago. We, we read that passage in uh, Nazarim chapter 20, verse 79. I'm going to memorize that verse now. Um about how Pilate just, uh, he, he called them out. You guys just squabble over everything and like, like your hearts are an unreadable scroll. I want nothing to do with you people. And so I would just wonder, and I hope that we're not following the same footsteps. Matthew 24, 44 through 51. This is at his second coming. Therefore, be you also ready for in such an hour as you think not the son of man comes. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, shall find so doing. Verily, I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Anyone, anybody want to be in that? I know we shouldn't do things for reward, but wouldn't it be nice to be in that position? But, here's the opposite, but and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, ah, my master delays his coming, and listen to this, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and smite means to, like, to, to uh, hit or to whatever, but it's also in a figurative sense, to smite is to, like, smite your neighbor in your heart. Very similarly, like, he says, hey, you've heard it was said, you shall not murder, but I say if you hate your brother in your heart... Uh, you're guilty of murder already. So in a similar way, this is not talking about just, you know, jawjacking people um, or, or throwing elbows around or whatever. This is talking about, you know, in a figurative sense, smiting your neighbor, attacking them, gossiping about them, slandering them, accusing them, uh, you know, 
uh, speaking ill against them all over social media, whatever. So when, when fellow servants start smiting each other, right, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the master of that servant shall come in a day when he looks not for him in an hour where he's not aware, and listen to this, and shall cut him asunder, snap, you're out, and appoint him with his portion with the hypocrites, there shall be weeping and gnashing of the teeth. Can you, that's a, I'm sure someone got a screenshot of that. Adam Fink exposed. Anyways, um, that's a good one for you. Anyway, any of my haters out there. Um, imagine you go through your whole life and you you finally come to a point of repentance and baptism, come back to him, and you're going through all the trials and tribulations of life and you're learning wisdom and all of a sudden, and right at the end, you want to get a little prideful and start like smiting your neighbor over whatever. You disagree with them or you think they're this or that. And you start smiting them. And what if you get cut off right at the end? How terrible, how tragic would that be? So this is a good time. We're getting close to Passover. I don't know when you're listening to this, but for those of you listening to this relatively close to uh, the recording time, we're getting close to Passover, less than 30 days at this point. And this is a good time for self-evaluation. Have I been smiting my neighbors? How am I treating them? What am I focusing on? Just some good questions to ask yourself. Again, not uh, not here to, to judge or point fingers. I'm just asking the question. All right. Um, let's go to back to Nazarene chapter 6, verse 16. Now, many people believed there would be two kinds of deliverers. We talked about this before. Um, uh, Messiah ben Yosef and Messiah ben David, of course, the, the suffering servant and then the, the king, the, the conquering king. So many people believe there would be two kinds of deliverers, and a man named Yosef Baraban had many followers. Yehusha met him at a house in Beth Gal and said, Why do you declare things which stir up the people? To which the other replied, What concern is it of yours? Reminds me of, um, um, Who made you a judge and over us? You know, to Moses. Yehusha answered him after this manner. Several men were sitting in a boat, and one began boring a hole beneath his seat. Seeing this, his companion said, What are you doing here? He answered, What concern is it of yours what I do beneath my own seat? And they replied, Surely it is our affair when what you will do is swamp the boat, and we will all be thrown into the water. Neat little story there. So it's like, in retrospect, or for today's world, you know, we are all should be of Yah's kingdom and representations of him. So if one of us is acting crazy and acting like a fool, it does put a stain on the movement as a whole. Does it not? It just goes back to what we were talking about, at least in our Torah portions about, you know, taking Yahweh's name in vain. You basically represent him. You're taking his name. And if you're a bad representative, like, ouch, that's not a good place to be. All right, Nazarim 6.18. So again, self-reflection, uh, self-accountability. Are you a good representation of Yahuwah and Yahusha and this movement of, walk, of walking in faith and obedience? Nazarim 6.18. Yahusha moved to another place and a crowd gathered around him. And while he was speaking, one of his first followers tried to push through to him. Now, this man was deformed and ugly. His eyes squinted and he was ungainly, but he walked in the light of truth. The crowd jostled him, shouting, Look at the ugly man. Push him back or he will scare the teacher away. Then Yahusha stepped down from where he stood and pushing through to the man, put an arm around his shoulders, greeting him affectionately. Yahusha said to the people, Why mock someone in whom the light of goodness shines? What matters the appearance of the body when the ruach within is bright? None among you has a ruach such as this man's, beautifully glowing with goodness. Gosh, I love Yusha. This I say to you, the body is of little importance, for it, per for it perishes at its hour, but the ruach never dies. Why do you treasure that which you can keep but a short while? For soon it will be cast off like a worn-out tunic. Surely it is better to treasure more lasting things. The shell of a pearl is ugly and rough. But men do not seek it out for itself, wanting only what it contains. And this becomes the cherished treasure of a beautiful woman. Never heed the external ugliness. Seek for the beauty within. Like, I, I don't know about you. I love you, Husha. And just like, like, 
I really appreciate this because I know what it's like to be to be picked on. Um, just a quick history of myself and why this resonates with my heart so well. Some of you may be like, "Okay, why is this? Why is this so important?" Um, I had a really awkward phase. It's long story. Okay, so from preschool to like sixth grade, I was in one school and such and such. My parents got divorced and I, I went from this school to another. It was a really hard time. My mom had to work overtime. I ended up feeding myself and I ate really terribly and pretty much just ate box. I learned how to make box mac and cheese and I pretty much ate that every day. Um, my mom tried her hardest, but it was just anyway, long story. But during middle school, I guess that'd be like uh, sixth grade through eighth grade. Um, I got really, really, really chunky. Um, and um, I, I had never experienced bullying before and shunning uh, because, you know, in, in elementary or grade school, uh, I was well accepted and had lots of friends and whatever. But in middle school, I was just like cast out. I was a loner. Um, I mean, people just like just disliked me and I think a lot of it had to do with my looks I was chunky chubby whatever and it just it, I remember breaking my heart I'm just like gosh you guys have no idea what kind of good friend I can be and in my I wouldn't say that because of course I'd get even more ridiculed for that um uh, but uh you know I, I got into high school and and um lost a bunch of weight and had friends again and, and you know all that kind of stuff but I, I'll never forget that time in life where people treated me terribly for my looks and I think that was a very important time in my life because um, I think that helped me see how others are treated for their looks. And it's completely unfair um, because you think about it, it's like, did any of us have a choice in our looks? Now, you know, of course, if if uh, we can control our weight, um, you know, there's some, some few people out there that have uh, health issues that that's much harder and those kind of things. But we can't control how tall we are, how short we are. We can't control... Um, you know what our face looks like and these kind of things and so how how crude and terrible to judge each other based off of really something that Yahweh made and um it's just this is this story just really hit home for me and hopefully nobody out there in in, in this movement is really you know stooping down to those, these kind of levels but i i was really touched by this story and just reminded um of just how awesome messiah is and so he sees this happening and he goes straight to them and he's like you know i've got my arm around you and, and it makes me think about um just how we're called to tend to the lowly so if someone is you know persecuted for their looks and ugly or whatever i think we should um take this story into consideration, follow our Messiah, and just, you know, figuratively or, or you know, lit even literally wrap our arms around these people and just take them in and love on them because they've probably been beat up by the world and that kind of treatment does has no place in, in Messiah's kingdom. But um, a couple other verses about outward appearance and you'll see that this is not um, important to Yahuwah. First Samuel 16, 6 through 7. This is when Samuel is looking at all the sons of Jesse. And it came to pass when they were come, that he, Samuel, looked at Eliab and said, Surely this is Yahuwah's anointed before him. It was the firstborn. I'm sure he was tall and strong and whatever. But Yahuwah said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For Yahuwah sees not, the, not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but Yahuwah looks on the heart. That's what's important to Yahuwah. James 2, 1 through 5, My brethren, have not the faith of our master, Yahusha HaMashiach, uh, Yahweh of glory with respect of persons. So in this case, we're talking about outward appearance with this little story about how Yahusha basically said to not judge the outward appearance. The body is of little, uh, little, uh, little worth. It's the inside is what matters, just like a pearl inside of a, a shell. For if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect unto him that wears the gay clothing, and says unto him, Hey, sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor, uh, Stand over here, or sit under my footstool. Are you not then partial in yourselves, and become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, has not Elohim chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to them that love him? So, how dare us, you know, judge people by their appearance or their societal position or where they've come from or their maybe lack of education or whatever. These people, these are our people. These are Yah's people. 
How dare us, you know, even go into those kind of things. James 4.11, speak not evil of one another, especially looks, brethren. He that speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the Torah and judges the Torah. But if you judge the Torah, you are not a doer of the Torah, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you that judge another? Matthew 10, 28, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. So don't fear men who can, who can do stuff to your body, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. 2 Corinthians four sixteen through 18, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed every, is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And so this is just talking about the focusing that the well, you know, the body. It's this is not, you know, the most important thing. Why right, right? why do you treasure why do you treasure this is back to Nazarene six twenty, why do you treasure that which you can keep for but a short while? Now, is he saying that we should hate our own bodies and neglect it and, and you know, do wrong to it? No, of course not. But there's so much focus on this and so little focus on what's inside. Surely it is better to treasure more lasting things. The shell of a pearl is ugly and rough, but men do not seek it out for itself, wanting only what it contains. This is how we should seek with each other. We care tall, short, um, you know, squinty-eyed, beautiful-eyed, you know, whatever, skin color. It's it's what's in here is what's important, and that's what Messiah is teaching, and to which I totally agree. So, book of Nazarim, chapter 6, verse 21. In the crowd there was a man who employed many others. So, he, this is a business owner, someone who had employees. And he said, Master, I am so stirred up by your words that I will give up everything that I have and follow you. It's very possible that he had just heard what Messiah said to the rich young ruler. Give up all you have and, you know, then, you know, sell, sell all you have and give to the poor and you'll have riches in heaven. Come follow me. So it's possible that he said, hey, I'm so stirred up by your words that I will give up everything that I have and follow you. Now listen to this. Yahushua said, how many look to you for food and employment? The man replied, my children are numerous, and I have many servants, and there is my father who is old. Listen to what Yahushua says. Yahushua said, The lives of no two men are alike, and all require the labors of many to support them. Even the greatest teachings cannot satisfy empty stomachs. Therefore, return to the place of your appointed labors and remain constant in your responsibilities. Give all you make over your modest requirements to Yahuwah and study the holy books daily. Like, wow. Because this has been an interesting debate because we look at what Messiah said to the rich young ruler, and for him... He said, you know, because he was rich and he loved his possessions, you, that's, what, that's what's holding you back. You need to give that up. And he wasn't willing, of course. But people have imposed that on everyone, saying you need to give up all that you have. Not everyone. There's, it's, this, is a, uh, this is not a, a wide belief, uh, but it is a, a fringe belief. And people are, are accusing others, oh, you have a, you have a car. You know, uh, so you haven't given up everything you have. Uh, you have um, uh, a camper or, or you even have a tent. Give up all that you have. Well, where, where, where does that stop? Or you have a sleeping bag. And so now, like, okay, well, you have clothes. I mean, where does the give up all that you have end? My point is, is Messiah says it right here. The lives of no two men are alike. Think about this man. He's an employer. Who many? It, let's just say he had 50 employees, 50 servants or employees. And all these children and his father, he, he, he supports all these people. Just like we learned last week, it's the duty of the rich to give to the poor and to, and to supply them with, with work, to supply people with work. So wouldn't that be reckless if this man just got rid of whatever, whatever um, company or, or business or, or, or farming, whatever he had, and just gave it all up and just put like 50 people on the street and, you know, his children and now, you know, where they're going to be fed? That's a reckless decision. And so this is why I believe that Messiah, when he was speaking to the rich young ruler, that doesn't apply to all of us. However, we all have a cost, right? 
we uh, we some of us have um, the cost of so maybe some of us are rich and need to give up our stuff. Maybe some of us are idolaters and need to get rid of certain things. Maybe some of us um, uh, put our our uh, careers above everything and that they need to give that up. Um, there's different things. Um, I want to share this. Uh, we read this earlier, Matthew ten thirty seven through thirty nine. This is kind of the extreme. This is the family unit. He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. So the rich young ruler, he happened to love his riches, riches more than Yahusha. And he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that takes not his cross and follows after me is not worthy of me. He that finds his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. So what, you know, what could it be? What could be getting in the way of your relationship with uh, the, the Most High through Yahushua and following Yahushua? Could it be your parents, like he's saying here? Uh, spouses? Children? You know, think about, think about like, uh, think about, for example, Job's wife is an example. He told, she told Job, after all the things happened to him, he's like, do you still keep your integrity? Curse Yahuwah and go die. Well, if Job loved her more than, you know, the Most High, he could have hearkened to his wife's really bad advice. What if, a, what if you love your wife more and is like, your wife's like, no, I don't want you to do these feast days and I don't want to give up Christmas and I, I want to do this, this, and this. Well, if you love your wife more than him, it, she will get in the way. And, she, you know, you've, you've then failed your test. Careers, friendships, your churches or assemblies, money, possessions, hobbies. People have different costs of coming into this walk. You probably, you may already know your cost. You may have already law how to give up something. And I believe that's what Messiah is really teaching here. That we all don't have to be homeless, you know, roaming the world. I don't, I don't think that's what he, he means at all. But cer certain of us have a cost. And for that rich young ruler, it was that. And so here, this is why, this is a great point in this book. Showing us that not every one of us is the rich young ruler. So, something to consider. So um, back to Nazarene chapter 6, verse 24. Yehusha said, A man without light places his faith in gold, bearing it in the ground so it will support him in adversity. Yet what benefit does it bestow if he never needs it? He worries continually and must be constantly on guard lest he be robbed. And when he dies, his inheritor spends it. Yet by charitable deeds and self-restraint, a greater treasure, which cannot be taken by robbers or dissipated by others, can be laid up openly without fear. So this is another, um, this is another look at what we get in uh, Matthew 6, where it says here, Matthew 6, 19-21, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust does corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust does corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so in this passage here, it kind of um, just shows us uh, what, you know, by here, that these are these treasures, charitable deeds, self-restraint, and of course many others are, self-restraint of course is like um, self-control, which is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Um, but through these things is how we can attain treasure in heaven that does not fade away and stays with us. Nazarene 6.25, someone in the crowd said, Great teacher, to some you say, give up all, rich, rich young ruler, while others you tell to continue in their ways. I have many responsibilities and a moderate surplus over my requirements. What should I do? Yahushua said, do what is right and just. Study the books of wisdom and live according to their teachings. Exploit no one and work for the rule or the kingdom of Elohim. So think about it. Think about that for a second. This, uh, this, pa this passage here and the one we just read about the person that was like, hey, I'm ready to give up everything. And he was just like, hold on, hold on. before you do, how many people do you support? I want to go back to uh, chapter 4 of the Nazarim, chapter 4, verse 37. We read this, I think, last week. Chapter 4, verse 37. The rich are responsible for providing the needs of the poor, whether by work or food. This, above all, is the prime responsibility of wealth. And if a rich man says this, he cannot do then his riches witness against him. 
For if a poor man has a loaf of bread, he will share it with he who has none. And a beggar at the door of a poor man receives better treatment than he does at the doors of the rich. Yet the rich have the most to give. And this is the sin of the wealthy. So just a reminder of what we read last week. Um, I think we're going to go a little bit longer. And um, I had a lofty goal of getting through chapter 6. But like I've said from the beginning, I have no timetable here of how long it's going to take us to get through this book. I'm in no rush. I think there's so many nuggets that I kind of want to take my time uh, doing so. So back to Nazarene chapter 6, verse 27. A man said to Yahusha, Master, I know the problems of the rich, for I have sons and many friends, but how can I know whether they love me or my wealth? Yahushua said a rich man owned, so he's going to tell a story now, a rich man owned a large warehouse, but one night this burned down, consuming all his wealth. And though he had given other warehouses to each of his two sons, when he lost his own, they would not help him. While poor, he met a beggar boy whom he adopted to fill the empty places in his heart. And going to a distant city, by hard work, he established another warehouse, becoming rich again. When the adopted boy grew up, the man gave him a warehouse, but one much smaller than those he had previously given to his sons. The two sons heard about their father's new wealth and sent word that they wanted to combine their warehouses with his, so that by trading together they could all get richer. The man then sent messengers to all three of those he had helped, saying his business had declined, and he was in the hands of moneylenders and required a hundred pieces of gold to continue. The two sons returned excuses, saying they could not help, but the adopted son sent two hundred pieces of gold, saying he had pledged himself to obtain it. So basically, he, he borrowed, uh, he took out a loan. Thus the man found out who loved him and left all his estate to the one he had adopted. So this reminded me of something that we talked about, I believe last week or the week before, about gaining friends through testing. So in a similar way, this man was like, hey, how do I know if my sons really love, really love me or just love my, my wealth? Or, you know, in a similar way, how can we say, hey, do I really have friends that love me or are they just here out of convenience or because of position or wealth or whatever things or what they can gain from me? Sirach 6, if you, in case, uh, well, we read one passage out of it earlier. This was uh, included in the uh, 1611 KJV in the Apocrypha section. This was considered scripture for a long time, also included in this Greek Septuagint. Uh, Sirach 6, 7 through 17. When you gain a friend, gain him through testing. This is kind of very similar to the parable the Messiah just taught. And do not trust him hastily. So don't be so quick to be like, ah, oh, yeah, this is my friend. There is a friend who is such at his own convenience but will not stand by you in your day of trouble, just like the two sons did not stand by their father in the day of trouble. And there is a friend who changes into an enemy and will disclose a quarrel to your disgrace. And there is a friend who is a table companion, but will not stand by you in your day of trouble. In your prosperity, he will make himself your equal and be bold with your servants. But if you are brought low, he will turn against you and will hide himself from your presence." Keep yourself far from your enemies and be on guard towards your friends. So you can love your enemies, but you can also love them from a distance. You don't have to be best friends. And be on guard towards your friends. A faithful friend is a sturdy shelter. He that has found one has found a treasure. There is nothing so precious as a faithful friend, and no scales can measure his excellence. A faithful friend is an elixir of life, and those who fear Yahweh will find him. Whoever fears Yahweh directs his friendship aright. For as he is, so is his neighbor also. Just some good wise words, um, really. And you know, this this reminds me. This story in itself kind of reminds me of uh, spiritual Israel. And let me let me explain that. Let's actually, you know, what? the scriptures can explain it better than I can. Let's actually go. We're gonna read the whole thing. I think this might be where we end. No, we're going to end on one other note after this. One more verse after this. But um, what I mean about spiritual Israel. So you had the two sons, his two true sons, who basically turned their back on him. In the, in, in, and then you have the adopted son who did everything he could to help his father. And so this makes me think about, you know, the the bloodline of Israel and, of course, just going astray and, and such and such. And then uh, we'll, we'll see this here. Actually, we'll see this in, in the, we'll just let the, we'll read the um, the parable of the king uh, giving a, a, a wedding for his son. 
Matthew 22. And Yahushua answered and spoke unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. This is Yahuwah making a marriage for his son. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. And they would not come. Like, hey, come on to the wedding. Again, he sent forth other servants saying, Tell them which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, and my fatlings are killed and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. Come on. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully, the prophets, of course, and slew them. But when the king heard of it, he was mad. He was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Of course, this is talking about this could be the, the burning of, of uh, when the Babylonians did it. Um, also, maybe even 70 A.D. Then said he to the servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. This is kind of like the first two sons that didn't really honor their father. Go therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So anyone, anyone that wants to believe on the son and the testimony, come on, bring them. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together uh, all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And the, when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how did you come in here not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So he, he's calling many to faith. But how few will be chosen because of faith and obedience, and it has to do with this garment. That's another long, you know, rabbit trail that we're not going to get into today. But maybe you can see that through this story, you know, the two sons that were um, initially, of course, um, called, or you know, and they did not honor their father, and then, he, then of course, the adopted one. Uh, but anyways, we're going to uh, end here, this last one, uh, verse 30, which is a really, a really interesting one and important one I want to share with you. Uh, this is not stream, chapter 6, verse 30. Speaking to the people about him, Yahushua said, So long as the great sun never shone upon the earth, there was darkness. And had it not come to shine, there would be darkness still. Without the sun, men would not have known it day from night. But when it came, both were made distinguishable. These times are a night of ignorance, wherein wrongdoing and bewilderment prevail. But a light has come to dispel the darkness and make right distinguishable from wrong. And so we know the Torah is light, but we also know in a greater sense Messiah is that light. And there's a passage in the book of Nazarene that I really want to share with you. Uh, let's take a look at Nazarene chapter 7, verses 8 through 9. Nazarene 7, 8 through 9. Um, here we go. While eating... Yahushua said, no man of himself can know right from wrong. This is much like in today's day and age. You have, of course, atheists that say, well, you know, uh, of course we stand for morals. But when when they're really kind of just making it up on their own. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll show you right here. He says this. No man of himself can know right from wrong. For what is right in one man's eyes may be wrong in another's. That's why we can't just trust in just our own our own thought of what's moral and what's not moral. Therefore, so for what is right in one man's eyes may be wrong in another's. Therefore, strife arises among them. Only when men accept a single standard of judgment and abide by it, live by it, can there be peace. Shalom. When men live together without the light of the Torah, they are like a house built with unmortared bricks. Or like men trying to tow a boat, a boat, but all pulling it in different directions. So getting nowhere. There are two laws, the law of men and the Torah of the Father who is in heaven. When I speak of the Torah, I do not mean the law of men. I am the light illuminating Yahweh's Torah, so men may see it more clearly. And though I fulfill the Torah, I do not change it. Never say this is right or that is wrong, but only this is right or wrong according to the Torah and in the light of Yahusha. I thought that was just an amazing passage, and I thought that was a really good place to end. So, with that, we uh, next week, brothers and sisters, y'all willing, we'll pick back up at Nazarene chapter 6, verse 31, and keep on choo-chooing through this book that I and many others have found to be an immense blessing. So with that, let's bless the Most High for sharing these words with us and many others, of course. Father Yahuwah, we just come before you again and bless you in Yahushua's name. Uh, Father, we just uh, thank you for allowing us to study together, and we just bless you for the opportunity. Thank you for sending your Son and making all this happen, O Yahuwah. Thank you for your words. They are a lamp unto our feet. 
in Yahushua's mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. And please, Father, strengthen all of us during these trials. I know I, we've heard from a lot of your people that are just going through the trials of their life. And Father, we don't ask you to take us out of the fire, but give us strength to abide in it and to burn off what you don't want in our lives, Father. Show us each and every us in the afflictions that we're in. Show us the lessons to be learned, O Yahweh. Messiah Yahushua's name. Amen. Hallelujah. Shabbat Shalom to you, brothers and sisters. And um, uh, we'll see some of you all uh, in the Torah portion here in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes. So with that, we'll end with a song. And um, I pray you have a great Shabbat or whenever you're listening to this. So let's see. What shall we listen to? Um, We're going to listen to this one. Seek his face. Shabbat Shalom. Blessed are you, Yahuwah Sabaoth. You gave us of your son so we could have hope. Taught us how to walk in spirit and in truth. He is the vine through him we bear fruit. Your words are Desire with every single beat Your Torah inside us Commandments we know Till that creature fall We wait until it's blown When you said Seeking my face My heart said unto you Your face will I see And sound that shofar And go with the shout Sing you praises, praises to our King, and clap your hands, all His people, and sing with joy to our Elohim. We're at the end, and surely we know the world is filled with lies, vanities, and woes. The people that seek Him turn. Should don't delay. I can always be, but his doctrine drops as rain. Keeping the commandments lest you walk in vain. His Torah is no burden, no matter what you're told. Sweeter than honey and worth more than gold. When you said, seeking my face, my heart said unto you, your face will I see. So far and go with the shout We'll sing you praises Praises to our King And clap your hands All His people And sing with joy To our Elohim Standing on my Zion Singing that new song and is chosen to him we belong Worthy is the Lamb for he was slain Made us kings and priests by him we shall reign Open ye the gates for those that keep the truth You'll give us lasting peace our minds are stayed on you Striving to shine bright like your menorah Walking in the way, the truth, your Torah Face will I see and sound that 
Praises to us.